so, oh, and so how do I find them? How do you find them? We just pick up the phone and start calling people. You uh, get on LinkedIn, you go on to Google, just Google, you know, workers comp people, ask around, you know, make some, make some, uh, uh, whenever you're talking to somebody, ask them if they know, you know, you tell them you're looking for um, solo practitioners and you want to join, you know, you want to reach out to them. This is the Art of Lawyering Podcast, a show all about making more money, being a badass attorney, and loving your life. The Art of Lawyering is all about becoming the best you possible. Whether you are a law firm owner, an associate attorney, or somewhere in between, this podcast is built to help you get the most out of life. Hello, and welcome to episode 19 of the Art of Lawyering Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Small, and I am excited to be back um, here with another episode, another episode with you. Um, thank you for being here, as always. Really appreciate your um, time and attention, and I hope that you're learning some stuff from this. Um, this week, um, we do not have an interview. I have, uh, well, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't get an interview done this week. I have a, a bunch scheduled for the future, but for some reason, there's a little little crack, little little dip here, and I didn't have one ready to go out. I thought that, you know what, maybe I'll just make something up and, and I giving you give you a, an excuse for not having it done, but, you know, I like to be honest with you. So, the fact of the matter is, I didn't get one recorded, and so instead I'm going to give you something else. Uh, before I get there, though, I hope you, you know, had a happy Easter or whatever. If you celebrate that, if you don't, then I hope you just had a good weekend. Um, I have had a great weekend. My mom is in town visiting, and she's here to see the grandkids and, and hang out and stuff. The weather was good, so that's always fun. It's always a time um, when I really uh, it's a time that I enjoy because that though that's where I really get to see sort of the results of my hard work. Um, because you know I've just taken the last few days off, I haven't had to do anything, I haven't felt a bunch of pressure, and uh, there's no boss breathing down my back. I didn't have to ask for vacation time or anything like that. I just take it make it happen so that's the point that I would love for all of you to get where you can get everything sort of working at for you um, uh, automatically you can take a step back if you want you could dive in more if you want but no matter what you do the choice is yours you know you're not dictated by economics or fear or anything else you can just do it so what do we have going on today um, today I decided that I was going to share with you a little bit of our member content and every month I do a um, live question and answer session with our members of Law Firm Confidential. We just had one last week. Uh, it was a really good one. So I thought I'd share with you maybe like 30 minutes of it or so. We typically go for an hour, filled up the hour this time and I thought I'd just give you a taste sort of of um, what life is like as a member and also just to give you some questions because I'm sure that if these guys have questions like this then then you probably do too and you know I'm, I'm here to help in any way that I can and I hope that this helps you so um, without further ado oh oh the other last thing is to look if you if these spark questions for you then send me a question at um, you can send me a question on Twitter at art of lawyering right we give it a hashtag question potent if you would like because that way I can search and find them easily. You can also just email me, chris at theartoflawyering.com. Um, you can also go to Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash artoflawyering, theartoflawyering, and you can find it, find it there and ask a question. Um, so there's all these places to ask a question. You have no reason not to. I'm answering them for free, right? I'm giving all my, all my tips and tricks away. So if you got something, ask. And that's it. I think that's about it for, for the intro. Um, once again, I really appreciate your, your time and attention, and I hope you enjoy this week. Next week, we'll be back with more interviews, more good stuff, and um, yeah, that's it. So, here we go. On Facebook, if you guys, um, okay, we got a couple more people here. You can ask questions. I think the top right, there's a drop-down menu. Ah, have I explored Facebook ads? Shreya, yes, of course I've explored Facebook ads. That is what is going to be next quarter's course is going to be all about Facebook ads. And it's next quarter's course because what you could do is some really that can help you to then put your stuff in front of Facebook. Um, I, I, well, 
Okay, let me back up. I have explored Facebook ads with the art of lawyering. I haven't done it yet with my law firm because the I've been focusing everything on Google AdWords right now. So the next step is to incorporate Facebook ads. What, and you'll see this through the course that one of the things that we will do at the end of this, this course is put a pixel, um, a Facebook pixel on your website that will start to build an audience for you for a Facebook. And then what you can do is you can do this really cool thing where, um, let's say somebody visits your site. Let's say, D, I'm going to use DUI because it's easy. Let's say somebody search, searches for a DUI attorney or they find your site somehow. What happens is when they go to your site, Facebook, um, the pixel, the Facebook pixel will sort of be activated and Facebook will know that that person has been on your site. And then the next time they go to Facebook, you can present them with an ad specifically about your services that you know they're interested in because they've just been to your site. So what you can do is you can give away, um, what you would do is you wouldn't just say, hey, if you got a DUI, call me. But what you can do is you can give away a free report, five considerations for hiring a DUI attorney that's gonna get you the best result or something. Then they opt into your list and then you can sort of begin the process of um, getting them to, to call you and sign up or whatever it is that you do. Um, if you are doing, uh, and, and that you can hopefully you can see how that can apply to pretty much any practice area that you have. Um, when it comes to uh, estate planning or something like that, where you you have a more general idea, you could all one, one thing that I would do is target um, parents, right? And then I would I would put an ad out there that says something like top ten reasons why estate plans are necessary if you have kids or something like that. Then again, you get an option to your list and. Bada bing, bada boom, you know, you have new clients, hopefully. So um, that is what I would do, okay? Or, or So yes, I have um, explored Facebook ads, and we're going to talk a lot more about that in the next quarter's course, okay? The, the, the thing, the problem that, that um, I am trying to fight big time is trying to do 100 different things sort of um, at a low level level of, of effectiveness and focus on one thing and, and really learn it and do well at it. And that's why we started with Google ads because Google ads can make you money like right now. Um, so, and then everything can feed off of that, that work that you do. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, ask a follow up. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Select Carol. How important are Google Plus reviews? I've tried everything to get them from clients, including giving the right instructions, but no one follows through. Uh, this is even though they all volunteer willingly and promise to post them. So um, I guess it depends how important are they for what, right? <clears throat> Google Plus reviews, like any review, is helpful for social proof. So if you're going to get a referral from someone and they sort of go and search for you and um, find you, then they can be helpful that way. With Google specifically, they can be helpful for um, local search results. So the, with the map results that pop up at the top, you can, um, they can be helpful and, and Google will sort of give you your uh, business more weight and, and more of a chance to show up in those results if you have reviews, okay? Now, as far as how to get people to do them, it depends on what your, um, depends on what your process is like for how you deal with clients, okay? If you have them in your office sort of as a, uh, an exit interview or, or an exit process, when you ask them, um, could I, you know, would you be willing to do that? If they say yes, just give them a computer right there, you know, and say thank you. It'll take 10 minutes. Um, it's already all set up. All you have to do is log in and give the review. That's the easiest way to do it because everybody gets busy and you know, people aren't necessarily lying to you, but it's just not a high priority for, for, for people to give reviews, okay? Even if you've done and provided the best service ever, um, it's, it can be difficult. Another thing that you can do, I mean, uh, but I would say this too though, you know, you wanna make sure that you're spreading your reviews out. So you wanna have Yelp reviews for sure. You know, you wanna have Avo reviews, which we've been talking about a little bit. So, um, you, you may want to sort of spread that out or give those different, different options. Give more than just one option for people to 
uh, leave a review, and you'll find that uh, people often go and leave something. The other thing you can do is you can always follow up. You can set a follow up sequence to to do it. You can um, give them something. We used to. Uh, I think we don't really do it much anymore, but we used to offer everybody like a five dollar Starbucks card for their time, just for the review. It doesn't even if it was a good review or bad review, right? We would give it to them if they if they told us that they wrote it or showed us that they wrote it. So you know you can do some of those things to kind of incentivize people. Uh, you can make up some T-shirts or something and send them a T-shirt. You know something cool. So it has to be something that they want. Um, but that is what I would say. Um, yeah, and given that, so what we, and so what we do is we send an email out with links and instructions and, you know, not everybody gives us a review, but we've got, been able to secure a uh, good number of reviews that way. All right. Okay. Next question is Justin, what are some time management techniques you use? What are some tips on being productive while you are sitting in court for hours at a time? All right, so I have, there are a couple different things that you can do. Yeah, you can bring some extra work with you and work on it, another file or something like that. You can, um, I would always have a book, uh, book, like a Kindle book on my phone or um, an iPad or something with me, and I would just read, you know? I would read a ton and uh, you can read case law. I typically would read business books and marketing books, mindset books, things like that, to sort of um, things that would expand my ability to be more productive and be, uh, be better overall. But you can read any of those things. That's a great opportunity to do that. You can also um, try to find someone to go to court for you. Okay, I started getting a lot of people to cover my hearings when I knew those things were going to happen, particularly if I knew I was just going to be asking for a continuance or something like that. Something completely procedural that any kid out of law school could go and do. I would find some kid out of law school and I would send them there to do it. Okay, not, not really. What I would do is find another colleague that was going to be in court at the same time and ask them if they could stand in for me and, and continue the case or do whatever it needed to be done. So, um, those are a couple of the things that, that I would try to do. Also, um, I would always try to stack as many hearings as I could. So I, I want to I, I wanna try to go to court as few times as possible with only one case. So that means if I got a new case or if I had a couple cases that are going and I'm setting the next hearing date, I would always look at my calendar and sort of just say I was busy or um, unavailable until I was able to get a hearing that I had already scheduled in that court house or in that courtroom, um, and then stack them all up, you know, so you're just spending, my goal is to spend like one or two days in court and have three days with no court time at all. Because for me going to court is a waste like a half a day, you know? So that's what, uh, those are some of my suggestions for that. Okay, up next is Audrey, welcome. Again, your question is, doing direct mail to recent arrestees, how long would you give this to take off? Sending out a weekly mailing from a list I buy from the clerk's office. So far, two mailings, maybe three phone calls received. So you're going to, in a direct mail or, or sort of, in, in really any sort of a response uh, where you're marketing in this way, you're, you're going to want to shoot for like a 4% um, or so from, in most cases, is pretty good. All right. <clears throat> but the critical thing that you really want to pay attention to is how many cases are you getting, right? Is it paying for itself? If that, if the answer to that question is yes, then, you know, you want to keep doing it. The other thing that you want to make sure you're doing when it comes to direct mail is you want to send out two different mailings, okay? You want to have an A test and a B test. So with the next list that you get, divide it into two and send out two different letters, okay? And, and uh, for the two letters, maybe just change the headline or change the, you know, like the regarding thing, or just change one thing that you can test to see if it will get a better response than the other one. And you keep track of that for a little while. And if you see one that's, um, one that's performing the other one significantly, then you want to ditch the one that's not performing and replace it with another test 
to try to beat the one that is performing well. And so over time, that your response rate inches up, 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 up. Do you know if you can get up to like a five, six, seven, eight percent response rate and then, um, you know, increase your conversions a little bit over time as well, then you can really start to have a significant impact from that direct mail. All right, let's see. Let me make sure I got all the, everything answered there. Oh, how long, how long to give it to take off? Yeah, I can tell you it will work if you can just find the right message and then also be good at converting those calls. All right, it, it can work. Um, it does work. It's just a matter of finding the right recipe to make it work. Okay, so um, continue to experiment and test, 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 test. All right, and if you're if you're um, if you're finding that that you're starting to get a lot of calls but not a lot of signups, then you know you may want to work on the signup process, right, to try to enhance that and optimize that to make it better. Okay, all right, good question. Okay, Jesse says, I'm writing my DUI guide. There's overlap between my blog and my guide. I want to copy and paste parts of some blog posts in the ebook. Is that okay? If not, should I include links to my blog posts? The answer is 100%. Yes, it's okay, and it's something that you should do, okay? One of the things that people will pay for or opt in for is convenience, okay? So um, condensing everything into a guide and using your own blog post is a perfect way to do it. And in fact, uh, we got some guys in the uh, um, in my mastermind group that are making um, some an ebook or or a guide or something, you know, and they're doing the opposite. So they've already created the guide, and I tell them, look, you have these ten steps. You have ten blog posts right there. So you have your next ten weeks worth of content right there. Just repurpose them and put them out as blog posts, um, and and it'll be fine. Because the guide that you're making it shouldn't be a standalone blog post anyway. So you shouldn't have any problem with overlapping content. That should be something that you put behind an opt-in wall, right? So get the free guide. All I need is your name and email address. They opt in, then you can drip them out some messages, um, you know, encouraging them to take whatever that next step is that you want them to take. And that's all good, all right? Um, don't link to the blog, po blog posts. They don't care, okay? Just keep, just sell it or, you know, just provide it as a standalone resource and you should be fine you should be fine there it's a great idea though to do that guide um, because that uh, you know presents you as an authority someone that's published that kind of a thing so that's cool too that's always good okay carol has another question let's see everyone tells me to network with doctors lawyers etc etc bar events have been a total waste of time what is the best way to network with other professionals great question carol there's a course in Law Firm Confidential called, I'm not sure what it's called, but I think it is, uh, let me look. Give me three seconds, I can post up. And by the way, while I'm waiting for this to come up, bar events, in my opinion, are a total waste of time, okay? I don't go to many bar events because my uh, potential referral sources are not there and my potential clients uh, are not there. So why, why go, okay? Uh, networking for success, okay? That is the go through that um, little course and it should be up and working, let's see. I'm still, so, all right. Let me see if these work. I, some of you know this, some of you don't, that I, okay, yeah, perfect. I recently moved the entire membership course over onto sort of the standalone site. I'm still working out some kinks. So if you go to the Networking for Success course, you'll see the introduction and the text under the the, uh, the icons doesn't seem to match up. That's okay. Just ignore that, okay? Because if you click on the, on the link to actually go to that module, then you will, the, the right content comes up. All right, so Carol, go check that out. It's a great resource um, for networking to create referral relationships. I learned that, and you'll see this in the, in the course, but I was taught this method by a buddy of mine that is a mortgage broker. He had his best month ever. I, I, I hung out with him last night. He did, I think, um, what did he do? He did 36 transactions last month, okay, which is 
um, what most people do, mortgage brokers do in a year. And the way that he's does, done this is he's created these sort of leveraged relationships where people send him business. And he taught me sort of the structure of what he does. And I then used that um, for myself to go out and meet, you know, uh, chiropractors and things like that in, in particular, but it, uh, it works. The key is, and the thing that's hard to overcome is that you have to understand that not everybody is going to be interested in talking with you and that's okay. All right. When it comes to referral relationships, you can got to look at it like this. You want to just build up maybe five to six, maybe, I don't know, I guess it depends on what the number is on what, on, on what a case is worth to you, but you know, you can get five or six people to send you one case a month, then that is going to create a significant amount of income for you, most likely. You know, on the personal injury side, if you could get five chiropractors to send you one case a month, then you could probably, oh, you know, once the cases started to close, be making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month off of those referrals, and not have to do anything else. So the key is to just understand that it's a long process. The networking process, okay, is a long one because you have to create these relationships, you have to demonstrate value, and you just have to um, allow people to become familiar with you over time and start sending you stuff. One of the things that you'll see, though, is um, in this course is when you talk to people, what you want to do is figure out what are their, what kind of problems have they had with referrals in the past, and then you, you show them or tell them why using you they won't experience those problems and then you ask them specifically to give you a chance and what I mean by that is you say look I would love to do business with you I think I could help your clients why don't you just send me one case one client and I'll show you what I can do I guarantee you you're gonna be blown away with my service your client is gonna be happy and then when that happens I'm gonna ask you to send me another one and, and that's how you do it okay so it's a, it's a, take some time, but go through that networking for success course. There's some good stuff in there, some good ideas. All right. Okay. Jesse says, I know you have made mention in the past of R. John Robbins. His site is very secretive of how, of how he actually helps. Should I take that as a sign that it's not a good idea or a good deal? So I, I have nothing but good things to say about Arjun. Okay, um, I he had I bought this course. This was when he was first starting his business. It's called like the Revenue Doubler. When I first started my firm, and what I thought was, look, you know, who cares if it's about doubling your revenue? I can just use this course to sort of build my firm at the beginning in a good way. There's a lot of good information in there. Um, his focus, though, is on management more than on marketing, okay? So eventually, that's why, and, and that's sort of why I drifted away from his uh, his courses and his information was because, um, you know, I was looking more for the marketing stuff because, in my opinion, you have to get clients before you really sort of worry about how you're organized because if you spend all day you know, writing up processes and procedures and stuff like that, but you don't have any clients, then you're stuck. Okay, so um, he he was not as specific as I was looking for, for marketing ideas and things like that. So, for example, even with this networking thing that we were just talking about, there um, it wouldn't get as in-depth as how-to as, as I do with my stuff. And that's just because that wasn't the focus. That's not the focus of his um, sort of his thing, you know. So, it, 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 I, what I would say for every everything is don't be afraid to test it out and give it a shot. I know that he'll give you an opportunity to go to a quarterly meeting, for example, for I think for free or, or just to see what it's like. Um, he will sell you hard, so be ready for that. He will. He was not afraid to ask for your business and sort of um, let you know that he believes if you say no, that you are limiting the chances uh, for success for your firm. But that's okay, because he believes strongly in what, in what he does. So 
you know, whether or not it's a good deal for you kind of depends on what you are looking for, right? Um, you know, yeah, that's it. All right, if you have a follow-up question, let me know. I'll be happy to talk about it. All right, let's see here. Justin says, how do you feel about including your price on your direct mail letters? Well, uh, it depends. Uh, if you're just going to list your price, I probably would recommend against it. If you have some way of defining the value that you're providing and then tying that to your price. And I don't mean cheap. I just mean demonstrating the value that your price is. Then I don't have a problem with that. Some of my Google ads have our price on it. The reason that I do that is because I want to eliminate uh, tire kickers and people shopping specifically on price. All right. The downside is <clears throat> if you don't do a good job of demonstrating your value, then you're not going to have anybody call because they're not going to understand why your price is what it is. So um, take some time to figure that out. I probably would. So myself, I probably would not. Um, I probably would not put the price in there. What I would consider doing is giving a way, giving something away for free and, and inviting people to call um, for a free message or to uh, go to the to a URL and opt in for it or something. Or you can just have them try to call you directly. It just depends on what you want to try to do. Okay. The, here's the other thing too that though that actually I guess the, the response every time is test it. So split, get it, do an A group and a B group. And then the A group include your price and then the B group don't and see what happens. You know, if you get more calls and, and more people willing to sign up with the A group with the pricing included, then you know you want to stick with that. If you don't, then, you know, there's your answer. You always want to give your prospective clients an opportunity to vote for what they like the best. All right, that's what's so great about Google Ads is that you can test everything very easily and see what works and what doesn't. They will tell you. Okay, let's see here. Jesse has another question. Back to my ebook. How long should I shoot for? When I send out emails, should I focus on providing uh, on value, providing content, or similar topic to what your email that you shared was like? Combo. What I don't know. I'm not sure what email that you're talking about. Oh, oh, the email that I shared that I sent out to people. Every one of my emails is not like that. Um, that was just an example of how you can really sort of personalize it and draw people into you. Most of the time I'm giving some sort of just uh, um, free helpful advice that's related to something that we do. So um, what you want to be careful about though is, is not being too legal, all right? Because you don't want to, for example, you know, as a DUI attorney, you don't necessarily want to be giving out DUI advice every week because that gets old for people. But, you know, maybe you can give out car maintenance advice or you can talk about i don't know all kinds of different stuff that's not specifically dui related maybe but that provides value and shows that you uh know what you're doing right there are other sort of bigger topics too that you can talk about that was what my email was about is that you know it's not really all about legal um legal work all the time there's a there's a bigger element to that and and that's what i was trying to show with that email okay all right let's see audrey has another question as is on facebook but how much of a difference does it make to have a client walk in the office can it be as effective to close the deal over the phone how's it different i um, for a long time demanded that people come into the office and i think if you can get people into the office they uh, have a much higher likelihood of, of signing up because to get to the office, they basically already had to sort of acknowledge that you were worth, <clears throat> excuse me, that you were worth the visit. But I also now do a, a many, many, many consultations over the phone, almost all of them. And that's only because uh, I feel like my marketing and my message is strong enough that if people are calling, they're already raising their hand and saying that they're interested. And, um, I can just take the next step over the phone and, and typically give them some good stuff and, and give them reason to sign up or not sign up. So I, I would say um, it's it's not as effective to do it over the phone. I don't think generally, 
but uh, it may not be that much less effective depending on what your sort of your sales presentation is like. And there is another module in Law for Confidential that I would be selling, and it's called the Perfect Potential Client Meeting. All right, that pulls out principles of this book called Spin Selling. And spin selling is not what you think. It's not sort of sneaky or, or anything like that or devious. It is um, situation, problem. Man, I always, uh, I always miss this one. Situation, problem, something, and then need payoff. But basically what you're doing is when you, when you talk to them, it's not about telling them what you're going to do for them. Like, hey, we're going to go to court. We're going to do X, Y, Z. It's more about, you know what, you're in trouble. How is this going to affect you, right? And they say, in the UI perspective, they say, I say, I say, what is important to you? What is scaring you the most? And they say, well, I can't lose my license because if I lose my license, I'm going to lose my job. And if I lose my job, then I'm going to lose my house. And if I lose my house, you know, then I'm going to lose my family or whatever. And the world's going to be over. And I'd say, okay. So it's really important to you to keep your license on a bigger level. And they say, yeah. And I say, okay, if you hire us, we will do everything we can to help you keep your license, okay? And we're very good at what we do. And so you can be rest assured that if you hire us, that will be our top priority. And that we can, we'll do everything we can to do that for you, all right? That's what people are looking for when they come and talk to you. They don't, they don't it's sort of like a, a, a plumber, right? You don't care how the plumber is going to fix the leaky faucet or the burst pipe. You just want them to turn the water on. Right, it's kind of the same thing with um, with legal services. Same with the dentist. Right, you got a toothache. You don't care. You don't ask him for a step by step on how he's going to, you know, fix the tooth. You just want him to fix it. And if he knows what your pain is, it's pretty much enough for him to say, "Look, I'm really good at fixing teeth. I can fix your tooth. Come on in and let's do this." And you say, "That's great." You know, so um, that that you know. Again, you can test this out, try to get people in and, and try to take some phone calls and see if it, if it significantly decreases sort of your sign-up percentage. Uh, but it's worth a test, and it's something that we've sort of started to do more and more um, is over the phone. Uh, the one thing that I would say is if you, if you are going to do it over the phone, try to a couple of times make yourself immediately available and see if that makes a difference as well um, and getting in your sign-up percentage. We typically always have people scheduled out. We don't take calls immediately, but you know that can have an effect potentially too. Because you'll, you, the hardest thing about having people come in is when they don't come in, right? They say they're going to come in, they set their appointment, we don't come in um, because somebody else talked to them on the phone and signed them up, right? So that's that's the sort of the other side of trying to get them into the office all the time. Okay, so right now we have no more questions. I will tell you too, by the way, this is re being recorded right now. It will be up um, on the uh, in the membership area relatively soon, probably not today, uh, maybe the end of the week, um, but soon. So if you missed a couple questions in the in the at the beginning, that's okay. You can go look at them afterwards. And I think that there is, um, I think the questions are somehow annotated in in the video with the ones that are being asked um, through the Hangout, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure exactly how it's done, but I think it's done. Okay, more questions. Fantastic, actually, let me look over here real quick. So, Carol has another question. Is it a good idea to link up with other new solo practitioners to further my own practice? And if so, how do I find them? Um, are, are you talking about referral relationships or are you talking about sort of joining up uh, as, a, as, as in a partnership. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by linking up, but, um, you know, I think other attorneys, uh, particularly with your practice area, can be good referral sources. What you need to find, and, and okay, I have to admit that I don't know much about Social Security disability work at all. In fact, I know nothing about it. So what I can say, what I'm going to say here can be completely off base, which is sort of 
twist it so that it works um, with what I'm talking about. So for example, if you have workers comp attorneys that don't do disability law, those would be great people to link up with, right? Because the, there's a likelihood that they will be able to send you some work. Um, and then whatever of those other practice areas sort of match that description, I would definitely try to reach out to them and uh, talk to them about what's going on. And the thing is too, is with those guys, uh, um, with those people, you know, I'm using guys sort of in the, I don't know, worldly term, those, those uh, guys and gals, you can also set up a thing where you can do some sort of a referral payment too. You know, you can do referral deals between lawyers where you'll get, you'll send them 15% of, the, of what you get if they refer, you know? So that's always something that you can kind of bring up with people and try to create relationships with them. So, uh, oh, and so how do I find them? How do you find them? We just pick up the phone and start calling people. You uh, get on LinkedIn, you go on to Google, just Google, you know, workers comp people, ask around, you know, make some, make some, uh, uh, whenever you're talking to somebody, ask them if they know, you know, you tell them you're looking for um, solo practitioners and you want to join, you know, you want to reach out to them or people you see, if you go to bar meetings, people that you see at bar meetings, things like that. Um, the sky's the limit on how you can find them. You just have to sort of get out there and start poking around. I think you'd be surprised what you can find. Okay. I really enjoyed everybody being here today. And the, the, the recording will be up in Law Firm Confidential soon. And have a great day. Have a great rest of the week. Have a happy Easter. And see you later. Thanks for listening to the Art of Lawyering podcast. For more great action-packed advice and information, visit theartoflawyering.com.